Alright. Yeah, okay. Hi guys, uh, we're back in my new channel, uh, Groove Talk, now with my friend from far, far away from Netherlands. Am I right, Martin? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So how, how should I call you, Martin or Martin? Because, uh, you know, the pronunciation. Uh, it's pronounced Martin. Martin, oh, okay, Martin. But most, uh, most people who speak English just say Martin. Martin, yeah, okay. <laughs> Martin. And yeah. once I, I know your, your name, I saw your name. It's Martin Plucker. I know this guy must have been a very nice bass player. Pluck. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I have been hearing the, the joke since 2007. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, am I right uh, when I pronounce uh, Plucker or Plucker? Uh, in Dutch, it's pronounced Plucker. Oh, Plucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, nice. Uh, by the way, I've been uh, visiting uh, Netherlands. I think it's uh, only once though in my life. I visited uh, Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and I stayed in my friend's house. It's nearby. What, what is it with the windmill? The you know the the touristic place with the windmills. I forgot the name. It's 15 minutes by bus to Amsterdam. Could, it could be a. Uh, I forgot. Them. <laughs> I, I have forgotten uh, as well. Yeah. <clears throat> but but Netherlands, I, I love Netherlands. And, you know, Amsterdam is a very nice and vibrant city. I really love. We back there someday, but well, you know, I don't know. We don't know when now, since the pandemic, right? We, we yeah. still don't know. Yeah, we still don't know. So uh, let's let's just roll on with uh, with. We want to know you more about uh, your background and everything. Uh, how did you start playing bass? Uh, you can tell us here. Uh, I started playing bass back in 2007 when I was uh, about 15 years old. Whoa. Yeah. And uh, I was in high school with some friends and we were in a music class. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't play bass, but I, I actually played piano. And I also played guitar. Wow. And I actually started playing recorder when I was six years old. You started early in music, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, so a friend of mine who was, who was, a, who was a drummer, he said, uh, say, could you uh, play that instrument? Mm -hmm. I said, what is it? He said, I think it's a bass. Okay. Oh, okay. So I picked it up and it was... Uh, I thought, oh, it's it's a lot bigger than guitar. There's, but it has only four strings. Uh, okay, let me plug it in. Uh, well, and as you know, when people first start playing bass, they always play like this with a thump. Okay. And I thought, well, maybe I could try this. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, doom, 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 doom. I was like, oh yeah. And my friend was like, I didn't know you could play bass. <laughs> and I was, and I, I said. I can't. <laughs> okay. So, and after that, uh, I was like, uh, I didn't know anybody who played this instrument. And at that time, I knew so little about the bass. I thought, wow, I'm like the only one that I know who can play this instrument. I must be special. I must be unique or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, and I, I knew so little about the instrument. So I uh, saved some money. And then a few weeks after, I bought my very first bass. Three. Three bass. Uh, no, no, what one bass? Oh, one my bass. My first bass. Yes, oh. which was an. Uh, they do, I don't think they make these anymore. It was an four-string uh, Ibanez GSR one eighty. Indonesian made. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> the cheaper is Indonesian made mostly. Yeah, which which was uh, almost like a jazz bass with this uh, brown sunburst, and uh, that was my very first bass. Ah, and then like a year after that, there was an uh, in the same shop. There was an occasion for an uh, a Fender jazz bass, Fender jazz bass, Highway One, an uh, American one, okay. which was uh, like five hundred euros. And I swore the Ibanez for the Fender Jazz Bass, and that Jazz Bass, I still have it. 
Okay, what year was that uh, for the Fender Jazz? Is it an old kind of jazz or? Uh, uh, I bought the I bought the bass back in two thousand seven, but it's made in two thousand and two. I think. Oh, it's still a new, yeah. But yeah, that's nice. American uh, made. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's an American one. It's pretty nice. Yeah, back then it's only four string, and now we have six and seven string kind of bass, right? So. <laughs> yeah. The choice is there. Exactly. So where are you located exactly in Netherlands? Uh, I live in uh, Alkmaar, okay. which is like which is like a forty-five minute drive uh, from Amsterdam. Forty-five minute drive is it pretty far then? Eh? Forty-five minutes. Uh, it's like forty kilometers or something. It's like uh, forty-five minutes by train or less. And do you play where in uh, for the gigs in Amsterdam or in your own city? Uh, yeah. I've played several places. Well, mostly my mostly venues in venues in my uh, own city in Alkmaar. Uh -huh. but also uh, very other places in Amsterdam, in uh, Haarlem, which is another Harlem. city close to city close to Amsterdam. Uh, Eindhoven, and I've of, I've also had some gigs uh, abroad actually, in uh, France. Oh wow, nice! In France, in yeah. Paris or uh, other Paris, but uh, near. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Nevers. Uh -huh. It's in the it's in the Nevre department. Mm -hmm. It's and also close to uh, the Bordeaux department. Yeah, 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 yeah. Back in uh, 2014 and 15, which was uh, very nice. Oh, very nice. Did you play your own songs or you play uh, kind of uh, other? I was, I was with my band to create my collection at the time, and it was a combination of covers and our own written oh, material. Oh, wow, nice. It, it must have been great, yeah. You uh, took, uh, took the car there or train or? And now we went uh, by car. Ah, that's nice. Yeah, and that's what I love about Europe. You know, you could use car and you could pretty fast being anywhere in the in different countries in Europe. Exactly. And, and it's just short times, right? So very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, any formal music education you have? Uh, music or? I, stu I studied at the conservatory in Haarlem from mm -hmm. 2010 until 2004. 14. Okay. That's Four. my music education. That's for a bachelor? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. uh, how did that help you uh, being a musician with that formal education? Uh, well, most well, certainly, just my whole uh, music theory was enhanced, you know, mm -hmm. learn about uh, chords and inversions and skills and theory. Uh, things from uh, jazz like all those enhanced chords all those inversions uh, timing uh, writing down music you know making uh, sheets all that kind of stuff and of course uh, improving your technique as a bass player and also um, doing studio sessions that's very nice but how did so, how did you learn playing bass before that formal education came? Uh, well, I fir first uh, first couple of months, I you know was self taught, you know, yes. like listening and just playing along. Right. And then I thought, well, I actually want to take lessons. Okay, I took a lesson. So I took lessons and I, uh, you know, learned how to uh, read notes and play skills and all that kind of stuff. Because, well, I wanted to uh, learn how to read music. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think after all these years, that was a very good choice to do. Uh, yeah. That's uh, one, uh, one of the, you know, very beneficial skills that we have to have as a musician here. Mm -hmm. Music reading, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm still learning to read music as well, you know, just by the, uh, you know, there is a, there is a software, it's called uh, Reading Factory. Reading Factory, okay. Yeah, Reading Factory. So it's all about the reading in bass clef, in treble, in every, you know, percussion, violin. Okay. 
almost every instrument they have and then lots of practices you know yeah, there's a lot of, from level one to level six so you could from the yeah. easiest one you know and and then ry rhythmic reading and then until the most sophisticated ones yeah yeah well reading music is is challenging right so it's, yeah you have to read every day is there any tips you want to to give for you know for non-readers musicians um actually funny thing is i attended a uh leave september uh i i attended a uh, jeff berlin oh class. yeah <laughs> it's a, a must uh, read lesson <laughs> yeah well but but the, the thing he said was and um the thing is is take all the time you need to learn how to read mm -hmm. you're, you're not playing any jazz festivals within the next year just take all the time you need yeah, yeah. to read if it takes five times six times six times twelve times for 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 a couple of bars yeah. take your time yeah yeah that's what he said mm -hmm. you just have to read every single day anytime we can yeah that's the key and I missed a couple of days not reading that. <laughs> feel guilty now whenever I miss <laughs> that reading session. But yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, when we play music, we don't have to read, just play. But but we have to keep reading. That's that's a challenge, you know. Yeah, exactly. We don't and that's why. Uh -huh. yeah. what and that's why. And that's why I've been doing over the past years. I've been doing uh, musicals. Mm -hmm. And for musicals, you can only do one thing, and, and that is reading. Yeah, everything is written out. Yeah, and there are other musicians, and there's the musical director who gives you the cue to yeah. start playing. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And yeah. That's, mm. that for me. That's the, the for me that is the best thing how to learn how to read, but also the most fun thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there is one one you know bad experience that I had uh, for the reading. You know, there is one. Once there was an offer for me to teach music in India for three months with a good payment, you know. But then yeah, it, the, the guy in the school uh, called me and we talked about some things for a couple of minutes. You know, he liked my playing, he liked my English and he liked everything. And then the last question is, do you read music? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh my God. You know, I, I, don't, I didn't have any confidence reading music back <laughs> even now i'm still not that confident but but I, i'm still you know working on it but back then you know short story is that i missed that i ha i had to drop it down the the offer just because i don't read music so mm -hmm. uh, and uh, from that time i promised to myself no rama you have to read music we have to learn to read you know, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, guys, whoever you want, whoever you are, watch this program. You should try to give yourself time and treat yourself by reading music, and commit yourself in in music reading. You know, all my guests so far, and including Martin, uh, they're they're all uh, you know reading music. So and it's been helpful for them uh, in their gigs. I have a friend from Russia, from England. He got, you know, uh, cruise gigs, and the cruise gigs requires you to read music because too many songs yeah. in a list in a show. <laughs> and when you don't read, you're gonna kill yourself shortly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever had an uh, uh, experience in uh, playing in cruise gig? By the way. Uh, no, I haven't done any cruise gigs. No. Ah, but it's very, very challenging. Yeah. It's, it's gotta be fun also when we could get that uh, kind of gig. And now uh, we we were we we're talking about uh, the challenging one now. How's the music scene there before the pandemic and after the pandemic? <laughs> oh wow! Uh, uh, we well we have a lot of venues in the Netherlands, and I think the Netherlands is one. I think it's one of the biggest fest festival venues in Europe. I believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, from March until September, mm -hmm. there's like. A, fe a festival almost every weekend so oh. there's a lot of live shows going on but um so yeah 2020 was actually going to be the year of really go breaking through yeah. in terms of live music yeah and then 
I think about January, February, we started hearing messages from the Far East. Oh, there's this thing going on. As I believe somewhere in February, we heard, oh, this pandemic has already reached Italy and Southern Europe. Oh. Are we worried? Uh, no, actually not. <laughs> and uh, my very last gig was in the last weekend of February in a, in a local bar. And like two weeks later, uh, our prime minister said, we have to shut everything down. Oh, wow. Everything. We can't do anything anymore. Oh. So, so all the bars, restaurants, venues. Uh, yeah. Everything was gone. They have to close down. Yeah. And what? <clears throat> what? What was your response when you he- when you heard that? The first time. Uh, first time. <laughs> I I actually thought, uh, wow, we've this is this has this has to happen in like decades yeah so our country has never been in the lockdown mm-hmm. i mean it has it hasn't been this silent in the streets of the netherlands in the whole country probably since the 50s or since the world war ii actually yeah it has yeah and and it, and there for the you know netherlands music in netherlands it's really uh, the, all the gigs are really gone right there is yeah they're gone yeah no single gig left yeah. But mo- as of today, well, more recently, there are very, very small gigs. Uh, but only at maximum, only one hundred people can attend. Okay. And they have to sit sit in chairs mm-hmm. with five feet distance from each other, oh. but no more than hundred people. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the most scariest thing that we musicians have to face right now that we have to lose our audiences not as many as before the pandemic right so it's really challenging everywhere the, my russian friend my english friend also faced the same the same challenging situation there and and wh- and what what are you doing then uh you know uh, during the pandemic session uh, pandemic <laughs> session <laughs> <laughs> It's, that's a very long session. <laughs> Unfortunate, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, well, what else can I do but uh, practicing bass? You know, work on timing, reading, mm-hmm. and actually, I have been doing a lot of recording for my well YouTube channel. Ah, oh, yeah, I saw that. As you know, as you know, I have a YouTube channel, so I've done a lot of recordings with some basses, some mm. uh, pedals that I bought, some strings. And I, I have, I, I have recorded so much material, so much videos. I am done until March 2021. Oh wow! <laughs> so you have lots of materials ready to I, put on. I have, I have a lot of material, and <laughs> I actually, actually, I have, why well, I have that new sire base, so I actually have some new recording to do. Yeah, you have to tell me about that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What what are your t- what are your tips uh, to survive being a musician these days? Then, um, well, well, actually, uh, if you can do some teachings, mm-hmm. you can do that. And a lot of friends have done the online Zoom teachings. And if you teach at a music music school and there is enough space, you know, to maintain the five feet distance. You can still maintain that. Uh, a lot of music, a lot of musicians have been doing a lot of online things, of course. You know, doing things on YouTube and a lot of rock radio stations have said, you know, get a YouTube channel, get somehow get thousand subscribers, and out of that, you can actually make money. Yeah. <laughs> and you also have lots of subscribers now. Uh, I have uh, about 1037 I believe. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh it's very very glad when we f- we find ourselves that we have you know our own YouTube channel in this pandemic, you know. But yeah, yeah it's the, there are some some things that we could do with our channel, you know. Uh even more important now than before before the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh I heard that there is a, you know, my English friend, 
the, he has a, a financial scheme from the government to support the musicians. Uh, we'd like to know if, if there is a scheme like that in Netherlands for the musicians. Is there any support from the government? Uh, there, there is so, there is something like that. We call it a social regeling. Or it's it's very hard to pronounce uh, to translate in English because it's like they introduced this like three months ago and it's oh. fairly new. Wow. But the problem is, uh, you know, there are all these rules and there's a certain amount of uh, jobs you need to do per month or per half year. There's a certain amount of money you already need to make per year. So there's a lot of rules and many people don't know if they can, can get this financial support. Oh, so basically it's not uh, totally free support then. You have to do something, some jobs to do that. Yeah, exactly. But I, I have to say, and this is getting a little, well, well, let, well let's not say political sensitive, but let's say, <laughs> let, let's say that in the Netherlands, the enti entire cultural sector, and not just musicians, but also people who work in theater, and sound engineers, uh, people who work at museums, you know, the entire cultural sector, well, we're, we're not we're not poor, but there is this whole thing. There is this like stigma, like we get this feeling as if we're treated like sort of second class citizens. Like our jobs do not mean that much to the Dutch economy. Mm. Okay, because you know, do, doing cultural things like being a professional musician or actor uh, in the Netherlands it's still, as of today, considered as some sort of hobby, like you do in your spare time. Really? Yeah. Well, sometimes people ask, what do you do for a living? Uh, people say, oh, I'm a musician. Oh, nice. And do you have any other jobs besides that? <laughs> There's a following <laughs> <laughs> That's you, you never hear that abroad. If you, if you ask an American or a Canadian or anyone else, he says, I'm a musician. Oh, wow. What gigs do you play? Uh, and here it's like, oh, do you, in the Netherlands, it's like, oh, uh, what else do you do? <laughs> that, that's, that's quite interesting uh, fact for me because, you know, I have some friends, professional musicians, they, he, they, they took a professional, a formal edu music education in, in, in the Netherlands, you know, for, for <clears throat> a bachelor. So, I mean, in their minds that Netherlands have a good music program. But, but then the fact that you're talking uh, about right now is a pretty a different mindset and yeah, different view. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, we, we, we uh, have very good conservatories in the yeah. Netherlands, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of musicians who have to take, uh, <coughs> not, not only because they already make very few money, but especially during, during the pandemic, they have to get back to school again or take another job just... Yeah, just to survive. To make, just to survive, to make amends. Yeah. Yeah, we face the same challenge here. So some musicians start selling things, you know, start selling food. They start, you know, creating new businesses beside music now. Yeah, because our jobs are totally gone here. Yeah. Almost worldwide, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, we have, we have to be strong now, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Russian, my Russian friend also has the same, like Indonesian. We don't have any support from the government. So we have to survive by ourselves <laughs> to create our own, you know, chances to survive. But we, uh, you know, we start selling things. We start selling our gears just to survive. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how many gears left now. I, I you know, still have the, that pink sire. Uh, but I don't know how, how, you know, how long it's going to last, though. But let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, let's speak about uh, uh, gears, the, the most fun yeah. thing to talk about, right? Exactly. So how many bases yeah. do you have right now? Uh, I... <laughs> you have to count. Uh, I have uh, eight electric bases. Oh, wow. And one... Uh, Ukulele, you base. Kala, oh, you still have your color. I, I sold my color. Okay. Is that color the first edition or? Uh, it was 
I don't know if it, if it was the first edition, but it certainly was one of the cheapest. One of the cheapest. Oh, so it might be not solid one. Huh? It might be the. No, it, it's a. It's a mahogany solid. Yeah. Solid mahogany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's solid mahogany. That has a better tone, the best tone for me, I think. Well, okay. I sold my color because the the what is it called? The tuning is always changing. That's my challenge. Yeah, I I, I have that problem too. Well, it has an inbuilt tuner. Mm. But the inbuilt tuner gave a different pitch than my clip-on tuner. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then you know, in one song, it's already changing in one song, so <laughs> it couldn't survive two songs, you know. So that's why I changed. I could not do this professionally in just one song. That's challenging. I already changed the strings to the white one, you know, the oh, white, white one. Yeah, the white one, and then the red, the red one as well. Okay. So they are known for the the stability for the tuning stability, but still it's changing. You know, I don't know why. Okay. Well, I don't know if you heard about these uh, galley strings for the U bass. Ga galley, I don't know. Uh, oh, then it's it's uh, very new. Uh, galley strings uh, has made uh, flat wound strings, normal flat wound strings, especially for the Kala U bass. Mm, okay, interesting. Because they I sound like like flat bounce instead. Oh yeah, they sound like flat bounce instead of the upright sound. Oh yeah, it's a different vibe. Mm. Yeah, I I love the 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 upright kind of sound on the uh, color U bass, but then yeah, let's see if I could get it one later on when we have more gigs. <laughs> <laughs> and what else? Exactly. The eight electric basses you could mention. My other bases. Um, what kind of brands do you have right now? Uh, pretty much, I have uh, the Sire, of course. How many Sires now? <laughs> uh, just uh, one, my V7. Oh, the U5? No, the uh, it's the Sire V7, one of the first ones. Okay. Oh, U5. You, it's not yours. The U5. The the short. The no, no, uh, no. Uh, well, not yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> right. No, I. No, this, this company sent it to me to. Uh, for the review, huh? For the review for the bassist, yes. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So, what is the other one that beside the sire there? Fender sire. Uh, I have a Fender jazz bass and a, and a Fender precision bass from 1977. Oh, oh wow, that's a gem. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and also um, a Rickenbacker bass. Rickenbacker, yeah. Uh, a Music Band Sterling HS. Oh, wow. Uh, one of those vintage fretless basses, those cheap ones. Uh -huh. And uh, some sort of, it's not entirely custom made, but it's, so, it's a sort of custom made uh, Dutch. The Gigabass. Okay. And I know that both Marcus Miller and, and Richard Bona have also a the Gigabass. Hmm. Really? Yeah. Do you have any six string? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we are four stringers. <laughs> four and five stringers. Yes. Four and five stringers yeah. So let's talk about Sire. How did you know? Uh, how did you get to know Sire? Because I saw you, just like me, we are Sire friends. We were in the website, Sire website, and then uh, people in web Sire website, at the earlier ones, is are the ones who use, uh, who own Sire bases from the first time it's released, like in 2015 eh? or yeah, 2015, yes. So how did you get to know Sire at the first time? Uh, well, I was looking for. A five string bass uh -huh. and f actually for no particular reason i was just on youtube uh checking out marcus miller okay yeah i've got that to do Let, let's check out marcus miller and then i saw sire marcus miller and i thought i don't know this what is this and then i saw i believe it was their very first interview or video that sire did with marcus miller and he said yeah, I'm uh, teaming up with this brand new Korean brand. They're making uh, four, four string bass and five string basses, uh, jazz bass types, uh, with a, a custom made 
preamp that they just invented and it's going to be like $400. Wow. And I was like, oh, okay, uh, where can I get this? So I just uh, went Googling. And then I found this uh, giant uh, shop in Germany, Toban. Yeah, Toban. And uh, they sold these. Or they did, they did sell them because when I wanted to buy one, the first batch was already sold out. <laughs> and so I had to wait until uh, I think July, somewhere July 2015. And I thought, well, maybe I should try them first. Mm. But 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 uh, they were pretty far away. They were all the way in the south of Germany. And I thought, you know what? It's the one that I wanted was just 444 euros. I was like, you know what? I'll just buy it. And if I don't like it, <laughs> give it a shot. I do. I give it a shot. Yeah. And so then, then I tried it and I was like, where has this been my entire life? <laughs> That's your first impression, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at that time, what basis did, uh, did you have when the first time you Fender? Uh, you already... I, I already had the, the jazz bass and the precision uh -huh. and the Rickenbacker and the music man. Okay. So how did you compare that V7, right, at that time? with your current basis? Uh, sorry, what, what was the question again? Sorry. How did you compare uh, when, from the first impressions? Uh, so, you know, automatically we, we compare our first impression with our current basis, right? The, oh, how did you compare your Sire V7 basis with, base with your basis? In terms of sound, quality, craftsmanship? Uh, I, I thought there were uh, very well built, very well built, actually. Uh -huh. uh, and, of and of course, the the preamp. Yeah. Gave, gave just that that exact sound that I was looking for that I couldn't get out of my other bases. And I was like, oh, I sound so much better for some reason. Yeah. And it, it, and of course, uh, I had tried other five string bases, uh -huh. which felt okay but not very comfortable and with this one it was like uh, well I, I i actually took it on a holiday with one of my bands and i had i just played it for a week and i thought let's take it on the road mm -hmm. let's let's see how it performs and within three weeks um uh, i couldn't play anything else but the higher five string bass Really nice. I thought, this, this, this is it. I, nothing else. I'll, I'll keep this one. <laughs> how, do you, how do you compare with Fender, the American Fender? How much difference do they have? Do you think? Uh, the neck feels the same or? Uh, well, by sire, five, by sire five string, it's five string. So obviously the neck is a lot bigger. But it still feels very comfortable and the passive sound uh, the passive sound yes you can you and, uh, uh -huh. i have to say i uh, have tested the uh, the new u5 uh-huh short scale and compared compared to uh, my jazz bass and precision bass uh -huh. I, th I think the overall volume and tone of the u5 is actually better than on the fender basses at uh, the volume okay yeah it's it's very consistent although consistent all over the neck oh wow for the u5 yeah okay nice uh what about the sound uh, uh compared to the fender for the v7 in passive you know because uh, it's been a long time for me i didn't play fender so sometimes i don't compare okay. I, I don't get that comparison head to head what, what do you think about that uh, in passive sound between v7 and fender is there much difference or which one do you like uh, <laughs> Uh, I think Sire is in passive mode just just as good or slightly better. Oh wow! Well, it 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 uh, it it of course it differs from every base because not every base yeah. sounds the same, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. But 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 uh, some people have said to me, yeah, it uh, just sounds like Fender. But like a third or fourth of the price. Okay, so so for for the uh, 
Fender's Lofer, they could survive with Sire then, you know? Oh, oh yeah, sure. I, I've, I've, seen mess I've, I've seen messages on Facebook and website, people saying, yeah, uh, okay, I'll just, I'll, I'll sell, I'll sell my Fender and then I can buy three Sires instead. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, all right. So, that's very nice and interesting fact. <clears throat> Yeah, I've never played Fender. I just played Fender, own Fender, only one Fender in my life. <laughs> I don't have Fender right now. It's too bad. Because now there is Sire, so I don't have any, uh, you know, no need for a Fender then. <laughs> exactly. But any precision, you know, like your 70s or 60s, uh, it's got to be so nice. And, and let's talk about U5. What's your impression about the new line of Sire bases? Yeah, they have five new uh, series, right? The U5, M5, uh, M6. M6, yeah, uh, and then what is it? Uh, P P7, uh, P sorry, P10. P10, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. And now U5, the 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 first short scale that Sire has and produced. Yeah. What do you think about the short scale? Uh, the com, the, you know, the comfortability. Is 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 it comfortable enough? Or uh, uh, yeah, it's. I think it's it it, it is the lightest. Light. Uh, lightest Lightest base I own in terms of weight. Uh, how, how much is the weight? Uh, uh, four kilos? Uh, I think less. Less than four kilos, wow. I think, yeah. <laughs> it's very, very light then. Yeah. But I, I must say, uh, of course, the U5 is also part of the whole second generation uh -huh. line of Sire. Yeah. And I think, I think they've made a lot of uh, good improvements. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, you know the volume knobs, the tone knobs. It it feels much better than the plastic ones on the first generation. So it's not plastic for U5. It's metal. The knobs. Metal. I don't know. Is it metal uh, or plastic for the U? Uh, no, for the U5, it's uh, for U5 is met some sort of metal. Yes. Okay, it's not plastic. Or, or no, or it's actually some sort of aluminum on plastic. Okay. Yeah. It's heavier than the plastic one, right? It's it's heavier, but it 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 uh, it looks better and it feels it feels better. Good to hear because I hate the plastic ones as well. <laughs> it's real cheap. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. the first one. Yeah. And I love the you know the the knobs on the M M series you know uh, particularly M five, a go higher. Mm -hmm. And it's still plastic, but it's nice than the. Mm -hmm. Just plastic ones, right? But for the M5, I think it's metal kind, kind of metal knobs, and M7. Okay. Really nice knobs they have. What do you, what do you think about the sound? Is it the, a volume, volume the knobs? Yeah, it's a volume, volume oh. tone. It's like V5 then. Yeah, yeah, just like a regular jazz bass, yes. Yeah, yeah. V5 has that first VV instead of VB, a volume blend. That's good. You know, I. I yeah, personally, I love the VVT than the VBT because it gives us a uh, much much more independence and much more power somehow for each pickup. For mm -hmm. the volume, it's very nice, very nice mm -hmm. one that I did. Kudos. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you would you recommend the short scale for people now? U five. You think? Uh, I think. Yeah, I think Sire has made a fantastic product actually uh -huh. you know c compared to other short scale bases like the fender mustang and the offner oh. bass, i think this one is actually more versatile all right for the yeah. setup uh, uh the pickups yeah i've i've tried i've tried it yesterday on a very small warwick bc10 15 watt speaker and i could get anything out of it uh, james jamerson oh. jack pastorius jack would uh, Joe Dart, uh, even slapping sounds good on it. I mean, I th I think if you want, if you have like, if you want a short scale or you have very small hands or you're just looking for a good bass, I think the U, I think the U five is definitely a winner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you want me to, you almost make me sell my V three for U five. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> there is an order list for me uh, for U5, uh, V5, and M5 for me to review in in next month, maybe September, October. Really, okay. I can't wait to know it to try the U5. 
And also the six strings looks so bad, you know. <laughs> looks so yeah. nice for the six string. Any dream bass you want Sire to make for you? <laughs> if it, there's a chance. Uh, I, I, I actually can't. Or any mass production I... you line Sire if you want, if you can tell them to make. Let's say, if, uh, let's say, uh, I want them to make six, uh, you know, six string with maple. <laughs> you know, some people want maple, <laughs> but they don't have it. Uh, well, I know, perhaps, uh, maybe uh, a U5 with uh, rosewood instead of maple. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, rosewood is. is yeah. I've seen a lot of short, short scale bases with, you know, like a, a rosewood fretboard and. This one, the U5 have maple fretboards that make make it sound very bright. Yeah, but yeah. they're very warm, actually. Wow, it's interesting. Yeah, maple but warm. Maybe mm -hmm. because of the pickups as well. Then, of course. Yeah. But rosewood, I agree with you. Rosewood on on U5, it's gonna be traditional, just like precision, Fender precision, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's make let's make them make it. <laughs> Well, it, it it has worked so far. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think uh, pe people always wanted to uh, make a six string, make a six string. Five years later, yeah. okay, here's a six string. Give up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, some people actually ask Sire to make a pure precision instead of PJ setup. And they're still not making it. Uh, with no uh, preamp, just. Yeah, passive. So that's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no J, just precision pickups. Yeah, precision. I agree with that. So maybe. Oh, why not? <laughs> okay. yeah. All right. Uh, what's your current and upcoming project so far? Uh, I have uh, three bands, in which wow. I play, and well, it's mostly, well, you know, practicing and rehearsing and not playing no well actually we have with the uh, cherry moon we have one gig in two weeks time and that is like the first gig i had this year since february mm -hmm. and with uh with uh, mr stone and the black dogs that is my uh, three-piece rock band we're just going to no write write new songs and with rachel my other group we are both releasing songs and still recording some songs but yeah playing live it's it's, it's probably not until yeah next year 2021 or something yeah still don't <clears throat> is there any message for musicians nowadays in this pandemic uh, in the big world <laughs> Want to say well what what would be a good hopeful message uh, you know because lots of musicians worldwide now are facing the scariest moment in their lives regarding for the survival in their profession I think uh, just somehow keep going I mean don't give up you have already come this far and you've ah. already done these amazing things yeah. don't throw it away well, uh, one one thing that 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 I now want to ask you is that how is the streaming kind of business there now? Nowadays, people you know start playing music because we we lose our gigs, our, mm -hmm. our real gigs we lose it, and then now they start making virtual gigs. We play from our home, we play from you know, we stream it, and then we open the donation. How does it? Donation, yeah. How does it work in the Netherlands? Does it work? Do people really donate some money? Uh, there are some, there are some, you know, big bands in the Netherlands who have done it, some sort of Facebook live stream, and you can donate like five or ten euros, ah. as you do, as you would know, uh, normally would pay for a ticket. Well, normally tickets are much pricier, but of course. Because live music music is so rare these days, it's like you no know, five or ten euros or donate whatever you want. Yeah. 
but uh, I some people have done it. But you know, if if even if you attend a live musical event, only one hundred people can visit, and you know, no musician is getting any better from it. It's just having that yeah experience. It's just pure, it's just pure experience and joy that you want to want to feel again. <laughs> <clears throat> but for the financial return, it's not as big as when we live uh, when we play live. Yeah, it isn't. Yeah. So sometimes I think that it's very uh, depending on the the countries, you know, the countries culture about tipping or about donation, right? Maybe it it it, it could be quite different in America, where where the tipping culture is strong there. Indonesian uh, tipping culture for Indonesians also not that well. So you know, sometimes you know people still feel not obliged to tip. Or to donate when they see live performance in streaming, when we have prepared all our best and perform our best, and we expect some appreciation. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 like it's like that old joke where you put a musician puts five thousand worth of gear in his car to go to a gig that pays three hundred. I agree. So you yeah. don't. <clears throat> <era. laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well. Martin, uh, actually, it's my 60 minutes program, so we're we come to uh, our you know the end of the program. But it's been right. really nice talking, a really nice interview with you, and I get to know things happening in the Netherlands, and it's very great, great point of view for us Indonesian musicians, and also some of my subscribers who see you know they're coming from everywhere in the world. Also, there are lots of side friends in my in my subs list. They could watch uh, this about our talk about the new U5 and everything. Hope they like it. Yes. Because you know, some people who ordered the new series, uh, the 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 bases haven't come yet. It's still on the way, or it's still in the process. It's kind of long, exactly. Right? Yeah, it's kind of long. Exactly. Yeah. At least three months waiting, and for Indonesian, it's at least three months waiting. <laughs> yeah, I don't know yeah. for the overseas orders. You know, it could be like mm -hmm. four or five months, or you know, in this COVID. Se session. <laughs> COVID session, yeah. It's much longer because I talked to them. I ordered some, some new bases, but then still maybe October, September, October, they would arrive. And I don't know for you guys in Europe, you know, for a tall audience. I think if I, if I order a U5 today, it would probably come next week or something. Next, what, next week? Next week, yeah, probably. Oh, from Tom. So they have already had the stock. They, they, they already have them in stock. And the company that gave me my U5, they already have them. Oh, uh, yeah. It's Tom. So, or is it a local shop? It's uh, called uh, the Music Alliance in the Netherlands. Oh, the Netherlands, uh, yeah. Now, yeah. The, now there's a shop who sells Shire there in Netherlands. Yeah, and there are also local shops that sell Shires. Now you don't need to buy from Toman anymore then. No. Ah, not anymore. You could try you could try new bases there, no? You you can actually try Sire base at, at your local shop if they have them. Yeah, do they have good... Do they have six string? Uh I haven't <laughs> looked. I haven't looked. You should check check that for me. <laughs> sure thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Martin, uh Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you for accepting my invitation. I'm very honored to have you here in my program. Well, thank you for this interview all the way from the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah. Hope I'll be back someday there after the COVID in the Netherlands. And hope I, we can meet, meet up there and play some songs together. <laughs> let's, let's, let's share a six string bass. <laughs> Yeah, or not, uh, sometimes oh, we could do a, a online jam. So uh, exactly, <laughs> session. <laughs> we make our own yeah. session. Okay, exactly. Martin. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you.